Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 68 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, the salutes are good to you on the red eye. How are you doing, man? <laughs> see you. Good to see you out here this week for our Super Cloud Great 7. Week. Uh, Great week. A infrastructure AI leaders in Silicon Valley put on with the Cube and NYSE Wired Community as part of our relationship with uh, getting on the floor of the NYSE. That's going to happen, and it's going to be great. We have the biggest deployment of media there on the floor in Wall Street, and that should be great. But that's not the story. Besides, I mean, we got great content. We're going to, we'll get into it later in the, in the program. But this week, Dave, has been the real tech uh, news of the week. We've been following this meteor from space with our little telescope, the Cube Research, and our team, and following Intel's fall to Earth, and, and it happened. Meltdown, layoffs, earned, stocks plummeting. We called it, you called it three times. I found three clips in our Cube AI uh, corpus of, of videos um, where we made the call. You, you actually said they can go bankrupt three times. It's been a tech bloodbath on some of these companies on hiring entry and mid-level positions. And of course, the cloud earnings are out. AWS and Amazon, looking at their numbers, we'll squint through those. And Meta and others, we called Meta. And I remember from the, on the Cube pod, I said Meta could be the AWS for AI, and guess what? They're looking like it's going to, it might happen. They're doing really well. And I call it the big four. The big four hyperscale is going to dominate all the GPUs. It's happening. And I think the earnings tell that. Microsoft was interesting this week too. And of course, we'll go through all the AI leaders. But Dave, I got to get into this right away with Intel. If you look at Intel, um, you know, we've been chronicalizing Intel. And of course, Pat Gelsinger has been a distinguished Cube alumni with us for many, many years. He got a bad heart cards dealt to him and he's got to deal with it but damn did you get it right i mean you called it um right on the number besides the fact that you get the market share numbers for amazon and others clouds right let's get into intel this is significant you know industry game-changing piece and i actually just listened to some of your clips this morning um you know it was pretty much right on that they were maybe overplaying their hand and, you know, no matter what Kelsey could do, you no, know, whatever magic trick he could provide, it's going to come down to a handout or they're going all in. And it's like they had two twos in poker and they've been all in and still the flop hasn't hit yet. It's like, yeah, I mean, and then it flop hits and look at the, look at their cards. What a terrible hand. Well, last quarter they had like a dead cat bounce and people were getting all excited. And you and I talked about this. We we're like, well, <laughs> the revenues dropped like 15% year on year. You know, this quarter they they missed their EPS by eight cents. They were targeting ten cents, so I mean, it's a big miss on EPS. You know, their revenue, you know, is is, is down year on year. It continues to be down. Uh, they <clears throat> they they're cutting their capex. They're laying off people. They're delaying some fabs. Um, it's the same thing, John. I mean, it's just, it's it's you've got <laughs> it's the same fundamentals that we've been talking about for years. Yeah. yeah. PC volumes peaked. X86 as a percentage of the overall market is in decline. You have the fact that AMD is gaining share on Intel and X86. And then you add to that the attempts to compete with TSM and Samsung and Foundry, and you've got the U.S. government trying to help out. But it's a drop in the bucket, as we've talked about before, when you're trying to open, you know, six fabs at 25 to 30 billion dollars a piece. Yeah, I say it again. If they keep on this trajectory, they could go bankrupt. And that's why they're ending the dividend. They're cutting employees. You know, and Pat's pretty yeah. upbeat still on the call saying, you know, the product roadmap is still good. And uh, it's, it's going to take a while, but it's... Um, the rearranging, the rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is not a good business model. Uh, but here's the hard news. They cut, they're cut. they cutting 15% of their workforce, a majority by the end of 2024. This is part of a $10 billion cost reduction plan. And they suspended their dividends starting in Q4 this year. Huge. Intel has always been the, the company. It reminds me when HP was going through that time where they were splitting, Dave. It's like icon of a company. Eula Packers was the founder of Silicon Valley. If you're going to go anywhere else and look at some of the big big companies that really were part of the legacy, obviously you had the semiconductor industry, but Intel was that brand. And then that generational shift passed the ball to say the Googles of the world, VMware, they went down, um, and then you and you, you know Yahoo went down, but Google's still alive. Then Facebook, now they're Meta. You know you have these iconic, high, high flying companies that were the DNA of these ecosystems. 
Um, and you know, it's just, it's just bad. Um, so you know, you know, it's you, terrible. You know, what I think is maybe even a better analogy is IBM's demise and, and almost, you know, again, IBM, they didn't know what to do. You had an architecture in the 360 mainframe that was the dominant architecture in the business. That was the monopoly, just like x86 was the PC monopoly. And it just started to crumble and IBM didn't know what to do. Yeah. You know, remember the big downsizing trend? They tried to say, let's call it right sizing. And they try to hang on. And it's just when you have, you know, exceedingly high gross margins, you know, like Intel and IBM had at the time. On, on a on a on a monopoly product like mainframes or x86, and things shift like they have with AI and like have they have with with ARM before that, um, then you've got new business models and you can't maintain those old margins and that's exactly what's happening to Intel now. But the the root of the problem continues to be volume. They just can't compete with the volumes that are coming out of you know ARM wafers. And they're, you know, obviously way behind on yeah. on AI and GPUs. Yeah. You know, Gaudi, I think, I don't know, that they sold like, what is it, a half a billion dollars in, in Gaudi? I mean, NVIDIA does that in like <laughs> half yeah. a day. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, what's sad, too, is that, you know, our, we have some fellow analysts in the industry. We see them all the shows, you know, obviously being paid by Intel to say good things. Oh, Intel's going to do great. It's just so disappointing that even some of the analysts got it all, like, not only wrong, but like the significantly wrong and, and you can just know who they are we know who they are but here's the quotes from pat gelsinger and then their see if i want to get your reaction this is their this is the statement this is intel's pat gelsinger ceo keep alone night our q2 performance was disappointing even if we hit even as we hit key product and process technology milestones yeah wait yeah rah rah second half trends are more challenging than we previously expected i mean if that's not the blanket you know statement of we're shitting the bed that's not there's, you can't get any worse than that. Here's the Intel CFO, David Zinser, said, the company saw, quote, gross margin headwinds from the ramp of the AI PCs, comma, unused capacity, and charges due to our non-core business. So there it is, Dave, right? They're trying to ramp up the AI PCs, no volume there, unused capacity, we've been calling that, and then non-core business changes. Yeah, they probably they, you know had some spin outs, but this is going to be interesting, right? So they they got to catch the growth, right? And there's no growth to catch. They got to get a big customer. If they don't nail a customer that's going to produce the volumes. You're right on. They're not going to get it, Dave. I mean, this that's is right. Intel's number one challenge. You got to get, Pat, sell a customer. Forget the government handouts. Forget standing next to Joe Biden for the chip acts. That all looks good on paper, but you got to get the customers. You got to have the product market fit. And I think that's where the ball has been dropped here. And, and, so, and John, the problem is they need wafer skip. Ben, ben Baharan made this uh, observation on breaking analysis. They need a wafer scale customer. Well, that's Apple. <laughs> They're wafer scale. You know, maybe Qualcomm, maybe could give them wafer scale. Obviously, Intel itself. But the problem is Intel is just so locked into the x86. And you see, you see it it dragged down Dell. HP, H, 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 HPE um, on sympathy, but I, I would say that's sort of overplayed because Dell and HPE are pivoting to N NVIDIA and Qualcomm yeah. as HPQ. And this so is, the, the analysts are like, well, is this product? Is it market? Is it execution? Is it strategy? And I'm like, well, yes. And it's execution from you know decade ago. And it comes back to volume. If you don't have the volume, you yeah. can't lower your cost. And to your point, you got to have a way for scale customer. You can't get the way for scale customer until you can get the yields up and the costs down. So they're in this death spiral, it feels like. You know, it's interesting. We had our film day yesterday for our semiconductor media day, AI infrastructure in Silicon Valley. So all the top CEOs and founders of the top semiconductors here, even some of the, the executives of the big companies like, like um, uh, ARM. We had Cerebus and they they're going to go public. They couldn't talk because of their own quiet period. But if you look, if you talk to like ARM, for instance, and I was talking to the ARM executives and, um, you know, I brought up the post that, that David Floyer from the Cube Research wrote, formerly Wikibon, um, wrote in 2013. And, you know, the first sentence really kind of summarized. And I actually used this yesterday in some of my, some of my commentary. 
he points out this is back in 2013 he saw the arm volume coming with 64-bit chip and he, he pretty much laid out the waves there was the post p pc era okay to the web oh no post pc era to mobile that was a big shift and then now we're seeing mobile to SaaS. that's a shift that's cloud and now you're seeing cloud shifting to gen ai okay the, and this is the market shifts we all know Dave, from history, and this is just us being students of following everything and being in the industry, all the executives from John Chambers, Andy Grove, they all say you got to win in transition. In these markets, and this is why we, we had this pod months months and months ago talking about Dell, how they took advantage of the web. Michael Dell manages well in transitions, okay? So we talked about that. Right now, if you're a senior executive and CEO of a big legacy company like Intel, if you can't win these market transitions, You'll never win because this is the time to win. And so Pat is going for it. So the question is, is he taking his lumps now, Dave, or is this truly a fall from grace uh, well, hitting, hitting earth? And, and that's the question that I'm going to be looking at heavily. Okay. Not being a cheerleader. Hey, AI PCs go Bowdy. Oh, come on, Bowdy, whatever. No, this is real. What is the market transition product that's going to get a wafer scale customers and put Intel back on the driver's seat? That to me is the, the the thing. We are in a transition to generative AI, system on a chip, kernel developers will be the new the new developers. You're already seeing it. All the successful Gen AI companies are are coding as close to the hardware in silicon as possible. That's basically kernel developers, not what UX path framework I'm going to use. We're talking down in the hardware. All the best companies. So there is going to be a surge, in my opinion of kernel like developers and whoever go moves to that market is going to make a lot of money and, and have a great job by the way nvidia chip company making software they got an ecosystem arm chip company uh, with an ecosystem the silicon companies dave are building isv ecosystems not their traditional oem little ecosystem they're building yeah. software ecosystems that yeah. means they're going to have channels of distribution devices to install the commoditization of with devices with intelligence generative ai data capabilities is absolutely going to explode and this is where the shift will will make money for people this is the white space that no one sees the developer community is moving from full stack to cloud and from cloud to full system stack and i'm telling you this is going to be a big deal it's going to be at least a 10-year run if not 20. it's going to change the landscape because a company like perplexity they're coding down to the hardware level that's why they get great performance. So I, I think there's going to be a massive architectural shift that we haven't seen in 40 years. The thing is, you know, Gelsinger has shown with VMware that he could navigate through shifting markets. You remember they, when they tried to do the VMware cloud and compete with, with Amazon and, you know, he pivoted quickly off of that. Um, and, you know, people might look back and say, oh, he could have, you know, managed it better. He had to do a lot of acquisitions and, it was sort of putting band-aids on, but he was throwing all, off enough cash to you know keep EMC around for a long time and and basically allow Dell the time to restructure and look at Dell now. So I would say that he's shown that he can do that. You know, the problem is he so he highlighted in the call on the call the the he he made an analogy similar to Intel's transition from memory to microprocessors decades ago that Andy Grove you know, initiated, but I don't see it that way because back then there was, we were on the, the beginning of the wave. You know, he even said, you got to ride the new wave or you end up dripwood. He was at the beginning of that new wave. Intel was at the time where the microprocessor revolution was going to disrupt you know, monolithic systems, mainframes and mini computers and, and Intel timed it perfectly and, and then took the leadership. Th that's why it, this is much different. Uh, they missed the the transition to to the volume mobile uh, by by choice, not 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 mobile, I should say, smartphones. They were very strong in mobile, but but in mobile silicon. But they missed the smartphone opportunity with Apple, and and now and and they were late to the AI. You know, Nvidia is leading that. So I don't see that analogy as holding true, John. I, I think it's it's much different this time. I think it's much more like. IBM in the late 80s, when they hung on way too long 
to mainframe like margins, just like Intel has hung on way too long to, you know, x86 monopoly. And because they were feeding the Wall Street beast and they just didn't didn't move fast enough. If I, I've said many times, if they had brought in Pat maybe 10 years ago, um, maybe even 12, 13, 15 years ago, and they started making these moves, you know, might have been successful. Right now, I would say Foundry and the cash requirements of Foundry are sucking the life out of Intel and are and are hampering the ability of Intel to compete with on the design side. I think it's just very hard to do do both. Yeah. Well, other uh, earnings, Dave, uh, Amazon, you had tracked the number almost to the number. Um, give us the overview on what's going on with Amazon. Well, I thought Amazon was interesting. I mean, this, the stock got crushed. Um, they did miss uh, revenue. They missed by like $780 million, but but their revenue is like 100, almost $150 billion. But they beat on EPS. I, I And AWS kicked ass. AWS uh, did 19% growth. So they accelerated their growth rate. Uh, they did 26.3 billion for the quarter. John, they had 35% operating profit. AWS, 35% operating profit. So that to me was a really big positive. I understand people are really con concerned about the consumer. You saw the job numbers today were soft. Now everybody's concerned about recession. Um, but I, I thought it was a screaming, don't take our stock advice, but I thought today was a screaming buy opportunity for Amazon fans because you and I have talked about this. I think Jassy's got a great handle on this. Um, you know, there's some concerns about the retail business, but, you know, when, when, when recessions happen, Amazon does better. Walmart does better. Costco does better. So, but the, but the, to me, the key was AWS, John. I mean, they absolutely crushed it. And so I thought the reaction today, the stock was down. I don't know. It was down quite a bit, uh, you know, low single digits. Uh, but I thought that was uh, an overreaction. Um, yeah. They're still, still throwing off cash. Amazon Web Services, 26.3 billion, growing at 19%, accelerating growth. Uh, they're still maintaining more than 50% of the market by my measurements, not by Wall Street's measurements that just takes whatever Google and, and Microsoft tell them about cloud. I've got Amazon at 20, 26.3 billion. That's what they announced. I got Azure at 15 billion and GCP at, at 5.2 billion. That's for IaaS and PaaS. Now, as we talked about last week, Microsoft and Google have a big uh, SaaS business. Amazon doesn't have that. So that's actually a disadvantage for Amazon because the gross margins and soft software are so much better. But as it as it relates to Amazon's core business, they're they're kicking ass, in my view. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Amazon is a sleeper in my mind. I think Jassy's gonna figure all that out. I think they're undervalued. I would definitely um look at them heavily. The thing about Meta's numbers too is significant is that they they're gonna be an AI company and clearly got all the GPUs stockpiled up. Uh, I think Amazon, it's going to be very interesting to see how they play their GPU stockpile. So as we watch Amazon, again, if Amazon's higher layer, layer of, of services, uh, their higher services uh, in the stack, if that's where their AI is and they don't let developers get down to the machine level um, and to, to the clusters, they might have be a disadvantage. If that becomes a programming head, uh, tailwind opportunity, that's where the opportunity is, Amazon might be in the wrong part of the stack, Dave. Okay. So it might not might be, be about SageMaker and and uh, their, their AI garden, okay, their tools, their bedrock. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to ask a lot of questions at reInvent, but I would not count out the hyperscalers, especially as they're going to get their lion's share of all the business, even though that the on-premise AI with uh, enterprises and the edge around the corner is going to be a very big part of the market. Again, different markets. The edge is smaller. Power uh, efficiency is key. And programmability is going to be key. So the software companies that have chip skills or the chip companies that have software, as NVIDIA has proven, that's why their stock's booming and their moat is so strong, is that if you're a chip company, it's not just OEMs and deals you do, it's what software you have. So it's 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 in a remarkable time in the industry right now. And these earnings all point to it. Look at Apple. It, it, Apple's you know, again, down. 
Yeah, well, Apple actually had a good day today when everything else was down. So did IBM. IBM was kind of flattish, but Amazon was down 10% earlier. They think they closed down 9% today, but 35% operating margins in, in basically hardware <laughs> and middleware. Okay. That's better than Oracle. And Oracle is an exceedingly profitable company. So can you imagine if Amazon starts generating revenue up the stack from things like Q and Connect and some of these other you know, higher level, higher margin, better operating leverage ser services. Uh, that's that's just to me is incredible. I, I asked Charlie G and Carlo yesterday at our uh, at our AI leaders event because he was saying, you know, cloud's more expensive, especially for these big companies. And I said, are they are they are they more expensive because they have a higher cost structure, or is it because they they have a price umbrella? And I think it's the latter. I think Amazon, if they really wanted to could bomb the market with pricing, but they don't need to. And why would they? Uh, but but I think they have a, a cost structure that's that's pretty um, pretty amazing. 35% operating margins. That's just blew me away. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, what else is going on? Obviously, we had our SuperCloud 7 event, which we released some survey data. But again, this is coming back to some of why these earnings are the way they are. There's a data market exploding, and it's going to be a complete... Um, shift, a so, market and product shift. And we did the so, survey between Snowflake and Dataverse customers and released it. Your breaking analysis last week was right on the money as you pre pre gamed our event on Tuesday. Um, that was so, a but before you go there, John, just real quick, you know, don't forget Microsoft and Google or Alphabet announced last week too. And I don't want to go deep into it. I thought Microsoft had a you know pretty solid quarter, but they guided, I guess the guidance was a little low. Their EPS only beat by a penny. And and evidently, you know, I mean, Alphabet again. I pay attention to the cloud stuff. I guess YouTube. You may know better than I, but YouTube was kind of the disappointment here. But I mean, these are companies that are, you know, eighty plus billion dollars, eighty five billion dollars in revenue each quarter for Google and Microsoft. You know, sixty five billion, and they're just so profitable. I mean, <laughs> Alphabet had twenty seven billion dollar operating profit. So I, I look at this as a little bit of positive positivity that it's taken some air out of the hype and out of the market. I, I'm I'm kind of happy about that. I just wanted to to just point that out to Alphabet and, and Microsoft. I mean, generally people are up, Dave. I mean, it's not like it's a massive scorched earth earnings season. It's the companies that aren't doing well in the transition, like like Intel. Okay, AMD. They've been quietly moving from x86 to their to their gen ai graphics gpu they want to compete directly against nvidia they're going to try to do that um you had um microsoft you mentioned that intelligent clouds up there azure's creeping up there if you look at if you back out the SaaS revenue um it's climbing up there um all kinds of new stuff going on dave i mean it's just google google glue but 29 percent i know uh, google cloud i mean google cloud grew so yeah, i think i think google cloud's Coming back very fast. I'm seeing a lot of action on there too. And GCP, you know, it's really nuanced. Not a lot of people pay attention to this, but Google Cloud Platform grew faster than overall Google Cloud. It's the first time they've made that statement. They used to make it all the time. First time they've made that statement in almost a year, maybe even a little bit more than a year. And don't forget Meta too. Meta announced. Meta had a great quarter. And this is, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. The ROI for AI in, in, in consumer. We talked to Charlie Kawas about this. The ROI for consumer AI is so blatantly obvious because if you can build a bigger GPU cluster, you can target uh, consumers better and you can make more ad revenue. And Zuckerberg Zuckerberg on the call was really impressive if you listen to the replay. Um, he's sitting pretty, I think, in AI. And and Llama is fantastic. I've been using it. It's it's Right now, it's my go-to <laughs> LLM. It's not that accurate, though. A lot of hallucinations. Test That's it true. It, it does hallucinate a lot, but if, but it's but what, what I find it really good is helping me organize data. If I throw a bunch of data at it, that's my data, so I know it's you know high fidelity data. I say put this in a table or organize it this way or calculate this. You know, I'll double check it, but it it does it really fast and it just saves a lot of time. I mean, we got thirteen billion in net income for the quarter. Yeah, I mean they're the. Really, the fourth hyperscaler. I, I think I've been tracking Alibaba as my fourth hyperscaler. It's funny, Charles Spitz, like, yeah, you're out of your mind. They're not a hyperscaler. I actually think he's right. I, I think you know, Meta is really the fourth hyperscaler, yeah. but of course they're not. 
selling commercial cloud to enterprises. But I'm thinking about dropping Alibaba unless they get their shit together because their their performance has been lackluster. I think I think Meta is going to is is and will be a major player in the AI wave. Like I said, there will be an AWS for AI. What Abe Davis did for SaaS market with developers, put your credit cards, stand up some stuff, and play around. That's the Amazon's really going after the enterprise right now, but because they got Microsoft. But the, you got to watch out. Meta could stand up, or Google Cloud. I said Google's got that. DNA where people who are coding right now were using Google Docs in elementary school. So they're now 20 somethings in dorm rooms. So this is a shift. And again, transitions is where the game is won. And Amazon Jassy should know this. And uh, if he does, he's probably thinking, okay, what's what's the transition win look like for Amazon? Clearly the numbers are down on the on the consumer side. AWS is booming. So very, very interesting market. Cloudflare stock jump, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. Um that uh, was good. I didn't. I, I didn't see that. I mean, I, I, used to, I, I kind of semi follow Cloudflare. I like Cloudflare. I do too. Well, um, I think Matthew Prince Matt, is awesome. I think he's he's Matt a good Prince guy. Is awesome. He's right. Wow, that's the founders are good. All right, Dave. So so getting back to super. One one, one thing. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. One thing I'm going to say is on Meta. You brought this up many times. Is OCP, um, the 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 open what is it? Open compute platform. The open source hardware, right? Which Meta was a big part of Microsoft too, to really drive costs down, create standards, get to market faster. Their, their open source playbook is is working. It worked in hardware, and now they're doing it with software. They've open sourced a lot of software. Llama, it's a great strategy. Yeah, open, open compute project. We were there when they launched it because we were, we were in, it was no, nothing, only a couple of people. It was Facebook, it was Meta, Facebook back then, and Microsoft. Satya Nutella was in charge of the division on the infrastructure side, if you remember, he was the one who donated all that IP to open compute. It was Facebook and, and Microsoft. And that set the agenda for Microsoft. If you look at the stock price when open compute started from Microsoft to now, that, that's the that's the Satya Nutella Midas touch right there. He completely transformed that company. Um, and even they would have no cloud if it wasn't for him. So the reason why they did all that IP, Dave, was Microsoft wanted to contribute to the code, as did Meta, to get people building stuff because they couldn't hire the engineers. Just like we talk about Uber building all their stuff from scratch so that they had to. Right. Remember, Facebook had to build all their critical infrastructure from hand. They didn't they weren't using off the self general purpose stuff. They had to, they wrote their own code. So, you know, at some point, if people aren't coming out of school knowing how to code in their infrastructure, you don't have DevOps. You don't have infrastructure as code. So very important point. Very important. Well, Amabaker was doing that back then, wasn't he? Oh yeah. He was he was doing hardware, wasn't he, at Facebook, Jeff? Yeah, he was part of the infrastructure. He was the data science guy. He wasn't doing infrastructure. You're thinking of Jonathan uh, Hellinger. He's at Vertex Ventures. Um, but, Dave, so let's get to the SuperCloud 7. So SuperCloud 7 we had, as well as our film day, media day for semiconductors, AI infrastructures in Silicon Valley, all the top people here. Um, SuperCloud was notable because we had both the CEO of uh, uh, Databricks, Ali Godsey, and the co-founder of Snowflake, Chief Product Officer, Benoit Dadjaville, um, come on, and it was really a cage match, um, asynchronously cage match. Yes, it was, it, 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 it was an asynchronous it, cage match. The, he the that turn. Cage match. As well as <laughs> leaders like from Microsoft, Dipti was here. Everyone like we had just a great lineup. Check out thecube.net. Go check out that SuperCloud Seven. It is a must watch, mainly because not only the guests were there, we had great survey data fresh off the the presses with ETR around specifically targeting a customer base where Databricks and Snowflake shared accounts, okay? And the survey questions co-authored by you and Rob Strecce, the Cube Research, was phenomenal. The data was illuminating. It was awesome. I'll let you summarize the data, but I just can't hold back. It was just like, it's so it's so obvious now what we've been saying is going to happen. The data model will flip upside down, the data platform. New rules are being written as we speak. And it is going to be not only in transition, it's a jump ball. No one, who's going to get it? Who is going to play in this market? It's whoever gets this wins everything. I mean, the great thing we did with DTR, they were able to in record time. I mean, I just texted Eric Bradley when I was the second week of my vacation. I'm like, hey, it'd be cool if we could do a survey. We got SuperCloud coming up. He's like, great, I'm on it. And they were in the middle of dropping their quarterly thesis which is 1800 they they pull all nighters so they can hit their webcast so they were launching that like the same week as we launched our 
our, our, our super cloud seven survey. And we decided let's go after not a huge N. We just wanted to get joint Snowflake Databricks accounts. We said, if we get 50, we'll get good data. We got 105 and that's how, you know, ETR, they're so fast. They put it together in, in record time. They cleansed it. Basically what it showed is that, that governance and security are absolute fundamental job one for the vast majority of customers. But at the same time, everybody wants open table formats. They want open source because they don't want to get locked in, but they don't know how to govern it. And so there's this emergent governance layer that's really, really important that folks want to apply to open table formats, but everybody's confused. They've got Unity from, from Databricks. They've got Polaris from Snowflake. They've got Horizon from Snowflake, but you need to be inside Snowflake to take advantage of Horizon. Polaris is true open source. You know, Unity requires, I believe it requires, I believe I'm correct in saying it requires some Databricks uh, services, probably the Spark execution engine, but I'm not positive on that, but I think so. And so, but anyway, that confuses people. You can, you asked the question, can you write? Can you read? Ali was like, yeah, don't worry about that. And so... And then you got Alation and you got Calibra, you've got Informatica and you've got all these governance players and many, many others. And so customers are like, yeah, we want open table formats. We want open source, but we're not going to go all in without governance. And then we, they, we, ETR discovered there was this, what they called the swing vote. There were like 14% of the customers said, damn the torpedoes. We'll figure out governance later. And those were the ones that were most likely to move off of Snowflake onto Databricks. And then the last thing I'll say is very clearly, uh, Databricks has the perception lead in machine learning, of course, and, and AI. Sanjeev Mohan thinks you know, maybe not as great as the market thinks. Maybe Snowflake's a little closer. Um, uh, but I would say my feeling is certainly in, in talking to the customers, the perception very strongly that Databricks has the lead, but it's <laughs> it's not insurmountable. Well, first of all, I you know, I like Databricks' um, bravado. I love that they're Bert, Cal Berkeley. Um, they have good, strong DNA, tech chops. They're very developer-focused. They are number two to Snowflake, in my opinion. However, um, you know, the Snowflake side of the camp doesn't see it that way. Um, the According to some of my sources, on the Snowflake side, a lot of them are basically saying Databricks is blowing smoke. Uh, they think they're overmarking their capabilities with tabular acquisition, and the Unity catalog being open source is a joke and a hack, according to them. Uh, and I said, look it, we're going to dig into this. Well, Ali Guts, he's not hiding, so he's he's out in the open field. So let's he's in the arena. Let's go talk to Ali. And by the way. Ali Godsey came on the queue because he's not afraid to get out in public. So uh, let's see if Snowflake can match them. But I said, whether that's true or not, we'll get to the truth because they're going to be transparent. Databricks is winning the hype war because the open table formats is hot. Iceberg is a winning formula. Uh, and But if no one's putting them in check, they're going get, to get away with it. So if, if people think they're, they're a joke blowing smoke and that their OS is a joke and a hack, great, let's check it out. Snowflake has to get in the conversation. Their AR team and their marketing teams are gearing up. Um, so they have, they, and Snowflake never had to do this, Dave. They were always from the number one position. So I guarantee you internally at Snowflake, they're probably talking to each other saying, hey, you know what? Do we want to punch down or should we just clear the air? So I think they shouldn't punch down the Databricks. They should highlight their strengths. Okay. So, and I learned this when I was at Hewlett Packard uh, and, and when I got, you know, they had great training and they had a, an ethos. Never talk bad about the competition. Just highlight your strengths that match their weakness. And so I think what Snowflake has to do and others is to highlight their advantages. Oh, well, that's a Larry Ellison. <laughs> well, I mean, you have, uh, um, you know, cult of personality founders like Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison. Still are going to do what they got to do. You know, right. You know, even Andy Jassy took shots at Oracle. Um, but, you know, at some point when someone's punching the face 10 zillion times, like like Oracle, you got to respond. I mean, at some point you just got to say, OK, let's drop the gloves. Let's go. Now, is that a moment for Snowflake? I don't think it's there yet. I think Databricks has a different strategy. They're clearly, you know, trying to force the market, move the goalposts by open sourcing everything. But that's what customers want. 
So I'm not sure I'm down on Snow on Databricks's attempt there to to attract developers with an open source concept. Well, even well, even if it is a marketing angle. Well, but, well, what they have done with their marketing is is they've definitely gotten the attention of people of customers. Ali Goetze's narrative and his vision resonates with people, and and I think that so one of the things that came out of SuperCloud Seven, and and uh, Molham. RF from Relational AI, I thought did a really good job of describing this. Basically, if you think about the, the so-called modern data stack, it's really changing. You know, it's got cloud infrastructure underneath, AWS won that. You had the DBMS, the modern cloud database, Snowflake won that. Then you got the data pipeline, that was Databricks, dominated. Open table formats, one of the other things that came out of the survey. It's, it's not game over yet, but Iceberg has the very clear lead. And then above that, You've got governance, you've got this, you know, some people call it the semantic layer, you've got data products, and you've got these intelligent data apps. What's happening, and I think this is a direct result of a combination of Snowflake's effort, the open source community, and, you know, this, this sort of marketing meld. What's happening is it's forcing Snowflake, because they're listening to the customers, to open up. And they're not, you know, they're being careful and really thoughtful about how much they open up. They're definitely doing... Um, uh, Polaris, uh, and, and they're doing managed iceberg tables, uh, but they're maintaining, you know, their governance ethos. So it's to me, it's going to come down to the quality. If you're right, if your if your sources are right that, you know, Unity is is blowing smoke, then that's going to be a problem. But but you got to remember they got a lot of smart people working on that, so they could close that gap. But what's happening is as Snowflake uh, shifts, it's 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 mindset to more open. The the source of control is moving more toward the governance layer. The source of value is moving up to the application stack to build intelligent data apps. And so they're running headlong into Salesforce Data Cloud, Microsoft Power Platform, ServiceNow, Vertex AI, Palantir, new era, new areas that the likes of Databricks and Snowflake, they're used to competing with each other and with Redshift and with BigQuery. They're not used to competing with Salesforce really directly head on. And that's what's happening. So there's a whole new dynamic that's emerging. And it's it's going to take three to five years to, 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 to un unfold. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, what's your big takeaway from this week? I mean, if I had to ask you, because, you know, I have some opinions, but what's your big takeaway from this week? I mean, my number one takeaway from SuperCloud was that that governance layer is really undefined. And it's kind of a free for all, and it is going to continue, in my view anyway, to be fragmented. I think that fragmentation favors a snowflake because most people aren't going to move off of their data platform and go just all open source unless they have a governance strategy. You're not going to have one, a, a strong governance story for quite some time in the open world. So they're going to have to maintain some level of stovepipes. And then I think the the second thing is from the uh, the infrastructure, the AI infrastructure leaders that we did with with uh, NYSE Wired. To me, there's like so much innovation going on in silicon, and and, I, and it's it's not all, not every one of those silicon new silicon startups is going to make it. Right? There's going to be there's going to be some consolidation there. There's a lot of money went in, a lot of innovation. You know, at some point, that little mini silicon bubble is going to going to pop, um, and so, some of them are going to find new markets. I like, I like the whole chiplet story around inference. I really like that. I think that's a huge market. I think, I think people are going to make it through the knot hole there. But I don't think any of them are going to take down Nvidia. In my view. Yeah, I mean, I mean my takeaway is that uh, the data business is going to be upside down once this AI infrastructure gains happen. Clearly, my big um, takeaway from an insight perspective that I wasn't really thinking about before this week is, is that I'm absolutely convinced that we're going to see a move back to the developer community for um, full stack systems develop developers, meaning it's clustered systems, it's operating systems, it's low level kernel programming that there's a huge need right now for generative AI apps to be performant and take advantage of the silicon. So it is now clear as day, super clear, sunny day, chips and what's around them, memory, 
interconnect stuff we've been covering in the weeds uh, in, de in depth is now here. It's real and it's moving fast. That means the next generation computer, whatever you want to call it, quote computer, think PC and server that you put in all these racks in the old days. Those are now systems clustered, a bunch of stuff together that's just a supercomputer. That is the new monster God box. It's like, hey, God, give me compute. That's the term we used to use in the old days, the God box. These systems need to be programmed. And the apps are now an opportunity because the people who make the chips are all building software core competencies, meaning they're designing the chips, giving them the TSMC to make them, but they're enabling programming. And I think this is going to be where the value will be captured. People who build on these chips are going to be big. And you see NVIDIA is already doing it. CUDA is a big part of their chips, although they still sell chips, but it's the software around it. You're seeing all these other folks building ecosystems. When you build ecosystems, you have channels because you're selling something because people are building on it. So if you're an IoT device or a IoT chip like SEMA AI, company we just interviewed, the founder of, they have to build a chip that's low power and can handle small form factors for not four customers or a category of the enterprise. They got to enable hundreds of thousands of use cases and different potentially software and data models. So that means that software at the chip level is now going to be what I call classic ISV-like, meaning those developers are going to look like what we saw in the cloud, pre-cloud. You get a platform, people build on top of it, they create value, that value is pushed out to the marketplace and, and, and monetized. That's going to happen with chip people. So you might see a shift to the applications on the chip, low levels of the stack, and then that's going to change the data. And what SuperCloud proved was Snowflake and Databricks will be the winners, clearly, one and two or two and one, how you want to look at it. They may swap positions. Who knows what happens? Then you're going to have a bunch of other players slide in there, and you're going to have a NASCAR race, an F1 race in the data space. And then whoever builds the most robust, reliable, performant data infrastructure, again, keywords, data infrastructure, will be able to feed cloud, on-premise, and edge. Again, this is the shift. Data analytics. I'm a data guy. That The old definition was database person or analytics. Creating dashboards, pipelining for business intelligence, or BI. That is going to still be around, but you're going to see the emergence of data infrastructure. It's going to look like cloud. It's going to be distributed, and it's going to look completely different. And I think Snowflake and Databricks and the cast of characters around this semantic layer horizontally scalable data with semiconductor integration is the future and nobody's there yet. This is absolutely a huge opportunity. Again, we've been tracking it with the cube research. You're seeing KubeCon settling in to be totally reliable with Kubernetes and everything around cloud native. The foundation for the next 20 years of companies who are going to build generative AI intelligent applications have to have a new foundation. That's going to be the next 24 months of action. And you're going to see it. Or look at look at Amazon's earnings. They're big. They're touting tr uh, um, the chips with AI. That's their differentiator. So I think we'll hear about that at reInvent. So this is the big game changer this week, Dave. This is going to be a market shift and product shift at the same time for existing players. So some will have to be in transition and they'll have to win. And then new startups will emerge. And those new startups will capture a big market share in transition. So I think it's going to be fun. Well, and, and again, I think the interesting thing is as you go up the stack and you run into these new competitors, you look at what what Salesforce is doing. Microsoft has, I think, I actually really like Microsoft's strategy. Um, their, their catalog purview, it's more than a catalog, but they want to be a catalog of catalogs and they're going to push down. They're saying, like, hey, use any catalog you want. We're open. I think that's a very strong message for customers. And it's a smart strategy because if 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 we're right and customers are going to continue to manage stovepipes and have different uh, governance catalogs for different workloads, Microsoft saying that's fine. We'll help you manage all that. Informatica is doing this as well, and some of the others like that I mentioned. But we'll push down into those catalogs, those open open source catalogs, those proprietary catalogs. That's fine, and you know bring it all into Microsoft. You know it's it's they lead with simplicity and it uh, works despite okay. their uh, deficient security. Well, we got a lot of action happening. Um, 
Paul Gillen just did a nice feature on Silicon Angle. JP Morgan's moved to the cloud. Um, SuperCloud said we talked about Black Hat's coming next week and VMware Explore is coming up. So if you're listening and you're going to be at VMware Explore, give us a shout. It's going to be a completely different show this year. We're starting to see a little bit different ecosystem. Next week, Black Hat, we're going to be in Vegas in the Mandalay Bay with the Cube Suite. So we'll be filming in a suite, and then we'll watch earnings come out next week. Uber and Lyft, Fortinet, Rapid7, Palantir, Global Foundries, Digital Ocean, Extreme Networks, and more. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting, Dave. So we're, we're going to have a very strong uh, August. And again, the studio at Palo Alto, the studio in Boston is, is massive and, and soon be the studio in New York City. Big news there. So stay tuned on that. A lot of people want to connect with you at Black Hat. I won't be there, but I've been getting a lot of texts from people. You can be at Black Hat. We yes. are. John's send there. My, send them my way. Zias Carvel is going to be there. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll try to we'll try to have some fun. Well, Dave, I know it's a short Friday because uh, you took a red eye and uh, I got to get back on the AI leaders. Got some more interviews to do today. I think we did like 28 interviews this week. Unbelievable. In the studio. So Not unbelievable. Like... Maybe 30. Yeah. <laughs> so so <laughs> it's awesome. You, for the people who don't know, we brag about the Cube AI all the time. One of the things we do with the Cube AI is we make all, the AI actually makes videos for us now. So out of the, say, 30 videos long form, I call them micro corpuses, Dave. Each transcript is like video is like a long corpus. We can make more clips out of them real mp4 so 30 videos will turn into i'm predicting 750 videos so imagine John, that dave 30 videos people were into 750 so people are asking me like how how can we watch the um the ai infrastructure leaders and we haven't released it yet so it's it's yeah so we're doing something new. It's going to be a film media day. We did a we did a film day, mainly because we wanted to make sure we got a great lineup. So we're going to stream that out between now and August twentieth. We're going to try to do it next uh, the week of the sixteenth, um, twelfth. Uh, but I have an exclusive one on one with Matt Garman, the CEO of AWS, on the sixteenth. I was trying to see if I could get fifteen minutes of him to put into the program, even though he's technically in Seattle. But we'll we'll, we'll sneak him into the Silicon Valley Silicon Valley banner because he's kind of close enough nearest neighbor there so but matt garman's going to have a long-ranging conversation about 40 minutes with them on the record with video um so that should be very very interesting and again i like matt garman i know matt garman um and so i'm going to find out what's on his mind i got a bunch of good questions for him if anyone listening has questions for matt garman send them to me and dave immediately we'll get them out there but yeah i like i think I think Amazon's coming back. I, have, I am very confident, Dave. Okay. I, I, I think, think Amazon that. is not going to lie down uh, at all. To me, there were a lot of overreactions in the market today. Um, Amazon was one of them. I think Dell and HPE were two others. I mean, they're, they fully understand it. For Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, they'll design their systems for whatever the customers want, and they're good at it. Yeah. Well, the only Amazon thing I'm skeptical about that I'm going to be asking about is, and I feel that if they don't pay attention to the startups, that might be, that is day one for Amazon. They can't ignore startups. They're cranking on the enterprise. We see that progress, but they got to enable the dorm room to the board boardroom. You know, my rap on that day board dorm room to the boardroom. Amazon needs to address those, everyone in between. They're a cloud. They're a utility. They're horizontally scalable. It's got greatness. Amazon Web Services and, and these hyperscalers, I love them. They're like a power, power plant of value uh, for anyone doing anything with computing and software. So the game has changed, though. Did you Market see? Market and product shift is here. Did you see that post by Jeff Barr? Two I, days did. Ago? I did. I did. The, 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 discontinuing access to a bunch of services, including AWS code commit. You know, I thought at first he got hacked. <laughs> like who wrote this, you know, you see the comments. No, I did not. Oh, people are pissed. People are pissed about the comms. You know, this is not customer obsessed. Um, what? Yeah. You should read the comments in this thing. So two days ago, after giving it a lot of thought, we made the decision to discontinue new access to a small number of services, including AWS code, code commit. While we're no longer onboarding new customers to these services, there are no plans to change the features or experiences you get today. And the comments were like, I think the issue is the communication. Which services? Where can we find the details? Why are people finding out in 
posts instead of comms channels. This and particularly impacts partners that are advised to build on AWS primitives. And Jeff said, I hear you, we're making improvements. So this is better and clearer for customers. And then, so but it goes on. I mean, people are like- Look at this comment. AWS just took their biggest ACE versus GCP and flushed it down the drain. Yeah, so it says, so Jeff Bard, this, first this was the specialty certs discontinued with very little comms. Then it's services, retired with no advanced warning, bad comms. Whether I'm looking at this as a consumer slash solutions architect or trainer, this is- Customer hostile behavior. <laughs> that is just bit. That's just total vitriol right there. So you know, you know you know, that's hyperbole. Adrian Cantrill. I don't know. Do yeah, you know I do know him. Yeah, he's a technical trainer. Yeah, but the thing is, he's just he's just laying it right hard and straight in his face. And he's not wrong. I mean, but yeah, he could sweeten up a little bit. You know, I, I sincerely yeah, hope you yeah, take yeah. in the feedback over this. Discontinuing services is one thing, but doing so without proper communications or prior notice is something else entirely. It's something I would expect from Google, but not AWS. <laughs> now that's a blow blow. These comments right are there. great. I mean, that's this, a is low like, blow. this thread is unbelievable. You know, we could do a podcast just reading these great threads. You know, I can just love oh, I them. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, have a great weekend down on Cape Cod. I know summer's so short there in New England. You know, California, I love it out here. Nice Silicon job. Valley, yeah. Like, yeah. But you gotta, I say that because I know you got a nice home. And uh, it's, it's a great place. I can't wait to visit um, this summer. I'll be, we'll be out a couple of weeks. So awesome. Look forward to seeing you. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks everyone in the cube. I go to SiliconANGLE, cube.net. Check out SuperCloud 7. You have to register for a short while longer. We're trying an experiment. So you people can get people in the community to log in because it's such great content. We still believe in free content. Log in. Of course, SiliconANGLE in the cube. Look for us at VMware Explorer coming up, Red, Black Hat and more. Of course, you know, we can produce events out of thin air. So you keep an eye on the cube.net. See you next time.